I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So this is James Altucher. I'm here with... Daniel O'Brien, who some of you may have heard of, some of you might not have heard of, but many of you have read his writings. Daniel, you write for Crack.com. How many articles have you done for Crack.com? Ooh, somewhere between two and 300, I think. Two or 300. And the one time I've written for Crack.com, which is a humor website, I got about a million views on my article. Like, you must have an insane amount of traffic. There are, yeah, it's really, it's, we've been doing this long enough that um, most of us don't even really think about it because the numbers just sound so huge that I can't even like intellectually understand them when we hear, hey, we just, we, this many hundred million people came to the site this year and that number is just, just bizarre to me. It's just like a, a made up word because. But it's like, but, it, but it's like though, like 30 million people have read your writing and you could just walk on the street and nobody's going to recognize you. Yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> it's I, I like being able to, to hide behind a computer with that. It's it's a it's it's a strange thing to to think about because I think if I actually tried to process what thirty million people looks like, I don't think I, I think I'd have a, a panic attack just thinking about all those people reading. And yet, and yet you jokes. you've also managed to combine two of my favorite interests, which are humor and presidential history. So you wrote a book that came out in March, uh, and it's called How to Fight Presidents, Defending Yourself de defending yourself Against the Badasses Who Ran This Country. And so what a great book. And people, people always say, you know, history is written by the winners, but you kind of teach us how to win. Like if we could learn how to fight these badasses, then we could win. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'm. History is not written by the winners, obviously, because I'm writing about history. Um, but I, I am certainly uh, trying to recruit an army of people who can defeat presidents because it's it's born out of. Uh, at one point, I thought I wanted to to be president. It seemed like an interesting thing, and the more I read about them, the more I realized, well, I don't have what it takes to actually be a president. There's no way I could uh, do what these insane men have done. But what's, so what can I do? Well, I could probably beat them up. I could probably beat up James Madison. So let's just start there. 
But but James Madison might be the only one you could beat up. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> like he was like what about five feet tall or something? Yeah, he was five feet, uh, five foot four, and like a, like a hundred pounds. He was just such a, a, a tiny little thing. And he had a high pitched voice. Yeah, yeah, he had a, a really difficult voice to listen to. So uh, it, it it sort of shows like in the TV age, he probably would not have been president. No, right. There's a, there's a, a whole lot of those early presidents that just would have been. Uh, disqualified immediately, discounted immediately, just because they don't they don't have any of the the media or press savvy, and they're not pleasant to look at on television. Now, now a lot of your book, of course, was was funny, and it's a humorous title, and it's you know the humorous idea. But there was some some real history. I like learned a lot reading this book, and I already knew a lot about presidential history. But the the main thing I learned was kind of this this overarching theme. That a lot of the – and I don't even know if you noticed this, but a lot of the presidents seem to be born sick or have sick childhoods and then spent a good part of their childhood like totally working out and training themselves to be superheroes essentially. I noticed that. It was such a strange thing that uh, I – almost all of them have that, have that trope and I don't know – I mean it's all – I didn't make any of it up, but I don't know how – how much of that comes from biographers who are just trying to sell a more interesting story? Like, they, like was Teddy Roosevelt really on on his deathbed, or is or is that just a, a a sexier story if you're trying to tell the story of the present? You know, but although, it's all I've read several biographies of him, and maybe they're all kind of quoting each other. But he was like a sickly child, and people made kids made fun of him, and yeah. in order to overcome that, like he went you know, to the Northwest and, you know, did all sorts of cow herding or whatever you do. And uh, uh, he was like, he, he trained himself to be a tough guy. And then he was in the Rough Riders and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he he was a, a strange example for me because I, I do believe that he, he was really sick. And I went to, on the tour of the, um, not the actual house where he grew up, but a recreation of it in New York. And they showed his, his, his like, terrible bedroom that he had, just this dark place that, they, that his parents kept him because they were really convinced that he was sick and he was going to die, and, they, and I guess the, in those days, you just you, you hide your sick kids, apparently. And so they actually, they actually thought he was, like, worthless. He was going to just die. Yeah, yeah, he was going to die. And they, they uh, oh, not a, a doubt in their mind. He and Hoover was the other one. Hoover was the one whose parents actually thought he was dead, like, put a, a sheet over him and covered his eyes with pennies, which was the custom to, at the time for when, when people were dead. He was a, a kid, and he was just sick. And, like, there was a doctor there and everything that was like, yeah, your kid's dead. That's a shame. He's never going to grow up to be president because he's dead. And he's like, wait, no, I'm, I'm super alive. Please don't bury me. Yeah, that was funny. So he was, like, two years old, and then later on when he was president, you said not bad for someone who was dead at two. Yeah. <laughs> And he was, you know, you actually present him in a really good, interesting light. Like, he basically spent his life helping people and, uh, you know, doing, like, in, in the, you know, post-war reconstruction and also when there was floods in the U.S. Like, all before he was president, all he was doing was helping people. And now he's totally considered one of the worst presidents in history. Right, and he's sort of, he was... Uh you know, who in his position would have been a good president with America being how, how it was at the time? Uh, certainly some, some could have done better, and obviously FDR was, was a better president. Um, but yeah, it really is a shame that if you know anything, if you know just a little bit about Hoover, just like superficial information, people will think, oh yeah, Hoovervilles, I remember, he's a terrible president, very little else about him, rich guy um, who hurt the country. And it's a shame because he's such a nice guy, like you're saying, and he's, he's led such an interesting life, but it's, uh, you know, you're going to get kids to memorize one fact about uh, a president so they can pass their test in school, and it's not going to be any of the interesting things. It's going to be, what is the quickest soundbite on Hoover? Oh, Hooverville's bad president. Good. Even though, like you say, you say, uh, you know, Roosevelt did good after him, but you also say in the book the Depression didn't really end until we entered World War II, which was like eight years later. Yeah. So, 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 how great was Franklin Roosevelt really? Now, I know you consider him a supreme badass, but mm -hmm. how great was he really? Uh, he's like what happens to almost all the presidents that he's uh, 
everything is always inflated. He's certainly remembered as 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 our greatest president, uh, and a lot of that is warranted. But he's also he uh, was much luckier than he was actually smart and and uh, and had a lot of screw ups, had a lot of bad ideas, and things happened to work out in his favor in a lot of ways. Which I always I should always start off when I'm talking about presidents that it's really easy. I'm 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 a I'm sitting behind a computer in in an office talking about FDR. Like, oh, he's not that great. Like, I could have done anything better than FDR. Well, let let's talk about that actually, because what you've done is quite impressive. You've created a career out of yourself writing about how to beat up presidents. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're the only person on the, in the history of the planet who's ever done that. So, congratulations to that. I'm sure a lot of people would have loved to have done that. How did you? Um, you know, not only that, you've, you, you've, you've created a career for yourself, you know, writing all these articles for, for Cracked. Millions of people have read you. Um, you do videos for Cracked. You, you do other stuff. How did, how did you get started? What's your, what's your secret origin? Uh, with presidents specifically, I've, I've just always been interested in them uh, since uh, probably since I was 18, maybe. There was, uh, I had a professor. I talk about this in the book. I had a professor in college who... Um, said, told everyone in the room that they would never grow up to be president, and that's when I started reading to really think about what it takes to be a president. And I got so excited because there's they they have such interesting stories. Every single one of them has, and and again, this is because we have the the gift of time and biographies exist. They all have wonderful narrative arcs, and they all and and they're all so insane and driven and exciting that I just even after this this. This class and this professor, I just still kept writing, reading about them. I was just nuts about presidents. Anytime I could, I could get my hands on something, biography or or an old journal or letters, any anything that I could possibly find was was just I just consumed it because they 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 were all such maniacs, and I and I liked that, and I liked seeing how uh, the common threads that that ran among and between presidents. And then uh, I wanted to to share it with people, and I've I've written a few articles for the site about presidents, but I really wanted to get as much. I just will never stop talking about presidents, so I just needed to exercise that demon with this book, and thought for a while on like the framing device for it because I wanted it to be accessible. It's one of the things that we do at Cracked. We're going to give you information, but we're going to pepper it in with jokes and and make it uh, easier to, to digest, so we can. Trick children into learning, and uh, the that, fight that, angle that's the goal of crack.com is to trick children into learning. Yes, yeah, uh, that's what I thought. Yeah, not all children. I, we use a lot of uh, bad language on the site. Please don't read the site if you're a small child or a baby. So, 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 okay. So, you, 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 did you? What happened then? You had this idea for the book, and then you pitched an agent, or like were agents already calling you because of your stuff on Cracked? I, I went to an agent that I met through a mutual friend of ours, Ryan Holiday, connected me with uh, this, this literary agent, Bird Lavelle, uh, who was just just phenomenal and uh, one of the the sharpest comedy minds of anyone that I've I've met, and it's and it's it's crazy because he's he's supposed to be a suit. He has agent in his title, and I I called him up and I talked about this idea for the book, and he gave me just fantastic notes and great advice. Uh, he's Still, my lit agent today. He's great. Like, like what? Like, like what? Um, what kind of notes did they give you? What's what's a sharp comedy mind? Uh, well, now I'm gonna blank and not think of anything specifically. But I. That, that's okay. I don't have um, I don't have like a, a, a an agent or a manager of any kind. I didn't. I just assumed that their main thing was I'm gonna help you sell this. But he just really gave on point like joke advice. You know, it's it's like having another. Uh, an agent slash comedy editor. You know, he's given really great notes and like, here's how you could fix this sentence to make it better, which I wasn't expecting from him. I expected that from the editor and like other people at Cracked, but he's he's uh, a funny guy with really good instincts. Huh. And then he got you, he shopped it around. Did he do an auction? Like, did people bid this book up? Yeah. Uh, it was between uh, Random House and Penguin, I think, because uh, it was at the time when they were too separate companies so you could still do that um and it was great it, it, it happened really fast he got both of them excited and he got both of them to throw uh numbers around and i really i, I loved who it ended up with because the my editor uh suzanne uh sent over a really really funny email 
expressing her excitement over, over the book and, and, and used a whole lot of fighting metaphors and everything. And, and I was like, oh, good. This is someone you understand the, the, the book and, and, and comedy. And I hope, I hope we get her. And we did. And then, um, uh, but, but, but let's reel it back a little bit. Like, you were already writing for Crack.com. How did you get started writing for them? I submitted an article in 2007 between my junior and senior year of college. I was taking a, a summer semester courses and was just a fan of the site and start, like idly wrote an article that I thought the site would like in my notebook in class when I uh, wasn't paying attention. Typed it up, cleaned it up as much as I could, and sent it to the editor at the time. And I just said, hey, I don't know if you guys accept uh, submissions like cold like this because we didn't have now we have a button on the site where you can click write for us and it takes you to our workshop where you can pitch articles and everything uh, at the time they didn't so I just cold emailed the uh, editor said hey I, I don't know if you do this but I I wrote this thing I think it will fit your voice it's about Die Hard and a new Die Hard movie was coming out at the time so here please tell me uh, if I sent it to the wrong place you know just what whatever 21 year old Daniel was thinking just just sending it out there and they bought it and they uh, bought a few more that summer and they were asking they started having me punch up other articles that came in because I uh, understood the voice fairly well and then uh, a few months went by and they, they wanted to uh, hire me or at least put me in the running for a job that was opening up and I had to say oh I'm I forgot to tell you that I'm a little boy I have to finish college uh, uh, I didn't I didn't tell you that because I did, I wanted you to think I was professional. And I said, that's fine. Um, we'll create this different position for you where you can work from home or your apartment or your dorm, wherever. Um, and then when you graduate, would you like to move to Santa Monica and, and work full time for Cracked? And I said, yeah. And I've just been bouncing around here ever since. It's been, it's been great. I'm really lucky. Uh, a lot of it was right place at the right time. If I had uh, waited a few months to submit the article, then we uh the workshop would have been set up at that point and i wouldn't who knows if i'd be able to distinguish myself from the workshop um well, because well, it was right 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 place at the right time i they i stuck my head out of the water i guess i don't know what what was the first article you submitted it was uh five lessons you can learn from from die hard we were a little bit uh silly of a website at the time, and I just was a big fan of Die Hard, so I wrote uh, a bunch of things that goofy lessons that you can pull uh, from Die Hard, and got a little bit more serious after that. I think we we my favorite article that I did my first year there was uh, Five Most Badass Presidents, and it's still an article that it is the most successful one that I've ever done on the site, and something that we could we brought to the publishers and like, look, I'm not the only one who is interested in badass presidents. Look at all the people who read this article. Let me do a whole book about it. How many, how many people read that article? Uh, over 10 million, I think. Wait, I'm going to look it up right now. Um, the five most badass presidents of all time. Yeah, 10 million, 750,000. Yeah. Geez. That's incredible. Yeah, that's, I, I owe a lot of that to uh, my, my boss then and now, Jack O'Brien, who is not related to me. Um, but he's the editor in chief, and I was on a call. We had the, our editorial call. Me, Jack, and uh, David Wong, who's the the senior editor at the site, and we were we were just idly talking. Hey, President Day is coming up. Does anyone have anything to say about that? And I was like, Oh, I've never mentioned this, but I've been studying presidents for like five years at this point, and I have a lot of information about them. Should I just write an article? And I. I initially was writing five most and least badass presidents, and Jack said, just cut cut the least. No one's going to care about that. Just do the five most badass presidents. And the day it went up, he uh, like called his shot for me. He said, this is going to be our first article that gets a million views in a single day. I'm calling it right now. And it, and it, it did because he's a genius and he does his job, and he, know, he knows it very well. Well, it's interesting because Cracked has a very particular style where it's almost like an anonymous voice writing the articles, but everything's based on facts mixed with humor. Like you said, it's kind of like all information, and then you sort of uh, fluff it up to make it funny in some way. 
Um, what, what's, what's kind of like, there's almost like a formula to cracked articles that make them funny. Like what would you say is, a, a, an ideal cracked article? Ideal cracked article is something that, uh, teaches you something new or ideally recontextualizes something familiar in a way that you hadn't thought about before. So I'll either do something, uh, one of my favorite early articles that one of our writers did, Shane Peter Davis did, was uh, about, uh, Damn, I'm not going to think of the name. It was just uh, things that all of your history school books got wrong. Everything that you learned in school about this such and such a thing didn't happen. Like all the George Washington and, and the, the cherry tree kind of, kind of thing where you're just mm-hmm. taking stories that are so familiar because they're just so ingrained in our education systems. And then like, well, guess what? That never happened. It was just made up for to sell textbooks. I don't know why they, they made up these myths and lies and... and taught them as fact, but I like things like that where they take something very familiar, whether it's something from history that you're remembering wrong, or here's a theory about this movie that uh, changed the way you'll see this movie. And, and uh, like, take that one, you know, th- th- things that um, are wrong in our history books, how do they then kind of punch it up to make it funny? Like, what's, what's the crack twist on that? Uh, I wish I had a more sophisticated answer than... Uh, dick jokes, but that's, that's that's a huge part of it. Just we, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's really the part that can't be be taught. Is that is just the the comedy part is knowing, uh, sort of reading as you're going and knowing where you as a reader would get bored if there wasn't a joke there, if there wasn't something something clever to balance out all the information. Like, um, I don't know if you can uh, on the fly, but can you think of a specific example in that one where it, w- it was a fact that was interesting, wasn't true, but then the way he said it made it funny? Uh, no, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't pull up a specific event- example. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no problem. So, so on, on the book, who is the most badass president? Uh, I go with Teddy Roosevelt a lot, and it's such a that's such a boring answer because everyone's like, well, sure, of course, Teddy Roosevelt, just because he and I, I use badass to to cover a lot of bases here. I do. He is legitimately uh, badass in like a, a tough man's man sort of way, very classic old school idea of rough and tumble cowboy. Um, he's also badass in that he's he's just a very admirable figure to me. He's, he's someone who, um, w- he loved war so much. He was, he was really big into war. He loved being a soldier. He loved being a fighter. Um, when he, he was excited about the prospect of leading America into war when he was president, but when he was president, there was no call for it. There was no reason for them to go to war. So he just didn't. And that kind of, that sort of thing that's for this, this lifelong soldier who was actively excited about the idea of war is still not going to let his, his personal goals uh, get in the way. You know, it's not, he's, what you can't say about every president, not that every president got us into war, but certainly they have their own biases, their own prejudices, their own things that they want, but he can actively look at the country and say, it's not best for the country right now, no matter how bad I want it. Um, but also... And- I love the story where he was running for president again, and he was um, he was shot and yeah. actually hit, and then he continued the speech. Yeah, he. Uh, I don't have the exact time, but he came out in the beginning of the speech and said, "This is going to be uh, brief because I was I was shot, so I can't really talk that long because there's still a bullet in me." And then he talked for like an hour. He gave a really long, great speech, which is another interesting thing about uh, Roosevelt, as much as. We all remember the the cowboy side and the Rough Riders and everything. He was such a an intellectual too. He was he was he was a bright guy and he was a great speaker and a great writer and thinker. And I, uh, it's it's great to have in a president or anyone that kind of good mixture of like of 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 tough, toughness and thoughtfulness that uh, you wish you could get. Okay. More. Now now, but a lot of presidents do compete for the title of most badass. Like first off. Uh, George Washington was constantly getting shot at, and everything was everything went wrong for him except for the fact that he became president. Yeah, yeah, he was another, and he's a he's a big guy, six foot three or six or or something like that. He's a a, a tall guy, very tough guy, um, very soft spoken and quiet. And yeah, would would go into battle, and bullets are whizzing by him. He got his his horse shot from under him a bunch of times. He would return 
from battle with just bullet holes in his coat from bullets that had missed him because because George Washington was just was just lucky or blessed or destined to be president something some strange I, uh, in the book I think I describe it as magic I think I made him a uh, wizard uh, but it's, but it's really he was a guy who n- never seemed to lose his cool and then a- another one that could ha- that could be a challenge here is uh, Abraham Lincoln because he was another one of those guys who was sort of born sickly I mean he had that Marfan syndrome where you you basically get these spider-like limbs that are, are kind of weak. They, they grow too too long and they get kind of weak. But he, yeah. he like chopped down trees, according to you, just to build up that muscular strength and he right. would he throw was, people around. Yeah, he was chopping down trees and he was carrying boulders around to, to strengthen those arms because someone told him that, oh, you're, you're sick, your arms are never going to be uh, strong. He was like, well, to hell with you. I'm Lincoln. I'll do whatever I want. So, and yeah, he, he there was uh, moved to a new town, and there was a, a a gang of of rough boys there that were that were just running and terrorizing the town. And he could just he just picked one of them up and and shook him. He could just he could just lift grown twenty something men and and just toss them. And so, if you were to actually, and then there, there's many examples. Then you had John Quincy Adams, who I never thought of as a badass at all. And you said he basically swam naked every single day. Yeah, he swam naked uh, even at like 50 years old, and he would uh, uh, like rub his skin with with a, a very coarse brush as like self punishment. Like he w- he was really big into punishing himself when he he didn't live up to his own expectations, and he would just like take an ice bath and and scratch the shit out of his arms like a maniac. And so it's these it's these facts that. Of course, we all know the history of all these things, and like um, there's kind of like the standard textbook history. But I think actually there's more to be learned from these presidents than the, than the basic history. The fact that they all seem to overcome huge obstacles as kids, and that's what gave them the kind of sheer aggression it takes to become president. Right. I think there's definitely something to that. There's something to the idea of learning that lesson early on that um, you can do – what people tell you, you 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 can't do. Not in a rejecting authority sort of way, but in a everyone says you can't do X. Well, I'm going to try to do X, and I did it. To learn that lesson early and to not have that um, hanging over you as an impossibility, like the idea that nothing's impossible, that really carries these people to the presidency. I think because it is such an enormous job. It's such a uh, a crazy thing to do, especially now. Just thinking about how 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 big it is and how many problems there are in the world and how much scrutiny you're going to be under from, for, for the media to be able to, to look at America and still think, yeah, I can, I can do that job. I can be president. I can, I can, I can run that. That takes a level of uh, confidence that borders on delusion, really. I mean, there's so many people who will not consider running for president because it's a job where, you, you know, someone might shoot at you. It's, you might get, get assassinated. Your your whole family will get called into, uh, c- pulled into the the media spotlight. Well, that's, you, that's, look, you also have to kill people. Like, yeah. So, so you look at like ev- probably every single president has been responsible has been responsible for at least one death. Right. Now, but 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 only one president, it seems, in, in the history you describe, actually indirectly tried to kill somebody. And that was Nixon. Nixon was, it's, it's crazy how much of a monster he was. That I uh, was sort of like dimly aware of, of Nixon, the, the monster, because that's, that's the, the sound bite that we get on, on him, that, oh, he was a, a terrible president and a terrible person uh, surrounded by scandal. And when I get, really got into researching him, I thought, I'm probably going to to learn to like Nixon. I bet we've only heard the worst stuff, and I bet there he's got a, a really interesting side too. I assumed, like all these presidents, I got to see in a new light, and he it really it really didn't bear fruit. He was just worse than I ever than I ever expected, and just, and like people who studied him legitimately think that he might have been a sociopath. They're like like doctors who looked into his. Uh, file or it's like this guy's kind of crazy this is a really dangerous man that we probably shouldn't have made president well okay so on the one hand he opened up relations with China he stopped the Vietnam War these are pretty big good things and on the other hand he tried to stuff someone full of LSD 
Yeah, he wanted to cover uh, someone's steering wheel with LSD so they can they would get in a car accident because I don't don't think Richard Nixon knows what knows how LSD works. (laughs) Um, And it's they're they're it's not like he's plotting to kill dictators or anything. Uh, or or public enemies. These are he's making threats against reporters who are investigating him because they think he's he's corrupt, which is true. Um, and he did open up deals with China and he the Vietnam War. I would argue that he extended our time in the Vietnam War uh, by five years because he's a maniac. That's right, because you said LBJ had the deal in place, you know, to end the war, and Nixon kind of. Uh put the kibosh on that he did yeah because he knew that if uh his opponent signed this thing and ended the war then he would never be nixon would never be president so he went behind everyone's back to get the keep the war going a little bit longer because that was all his opponent had really um and then when that was taken away nixon's like well gotta vote for nixon then and i'll i'll end this war that i i prolonged so you would vote for me now um which president surprised you the most when you started researching them? I was pretty surprised by uh, a couple of things. Polk, Polk really got me, only because I didn't have any preconceived ideas of, of Polk. He's just sort of a, a forgettable president for me. Um, and then learning that he very pointedly set out when he was president, look, here are, here are the three things that... I, I'm going to do when I'm president, and that's it. And then actually did them, actually accomplished the three things that he said he was going to do. Didn't want to run for a second term. He's like, no, I did it. I did exactly what I said I was going to do, and now I'm going to go uh, die somewhere. And he did that. And I just sort of, re- uh, no other president has that track record. Plenty have done more than him, but no one has done, here's a checklist of things that I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to get America larger. I'm going to take us all the way to California. Whatever, what, no one else has really been able to boast that kind of success rate of actually accomplishing what you set out to do. And the one, the one president who's usually considered the, the most boring or, or worst president is uh, Millard Fillmore, and you kind of confirmed that. Like, he just did nothing. He did absolutely nothing, and he wasn't even bad in an interesting way. It's not, it's, it was so frustrating researching that chapter because the whole the book was sold on the on the, the the promise that all these presidents are going to be interesting. There's going to be great material for every single one of them, uh, and I believed that in my in my gut because you can't be president if you didn't lead lead an interesting life. And then Fillmore just broke that. He broke the entire promise of this book because he is so freaking boring and bland that I couldn't. You, you can't rubbed together two good sentences about the guy. But it it seemed also like there was three presidents in a row, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan, all of which they were so afraid afraid of the slavery issue that it basically incapacitated them during their terms. Yeah, yeah, they were just, they, no one wanted to be, everyone could see where America was going, no one wanted to to nudge anything in, in the wrong direction, so they all had that kind of mentality of, well, I'll just sit here quietly uh, and hope this blows over. And if it doesn't, my term will be up and it'll be the next guy's problem. And, you know, Buchanan, you mentioned as this huge partier, you didn't mention this one story, which on his inauguration, I think the party got so huge in the White House that he had to, like, jump out of the second floor window in order to kind of escape the crowd. Is that true? I I actually thought I heard that about Jackson, but maybe you're... Maybe you're right about that. I've heard that about Buchanan. Um, I also always wondered if Buchanan was gay or not, like the one gay president. Yeah, that's there are some people. I mean, we'll never know for sure. That's certainly where a lot of uh, scholars lean towards. Um, he was another one that me, was, me being a scholar. Yeah, yeah. He was another one that super in, uh, interested me because he had that. Uh, he had, he was engaged to a woman who then the engagement broke off, and then she died under mysterious circumstances, uh, and Buchanan was not allowed. At her funeral, her her father hated him and forbid him from from ever going. So, and there was always it was really really strange circumstances. Nobody knew exactly. I don't I don't think Buchanan killed her or anything like that. But everyone knows there's something we've all decided is really strange about that chain of events. And Buchanan didn't speak to it at the time, but wrote. Uh, he said he wrote a letter. He's like, I want you to open this letter on my death. It'll explain absolutely everything 
uh, about me and about this death and about our relationship. Just open it when I'm dead. And as he was getting, years and years later, as he get, I was getting closer to death, he just said, uh, wrote another letter that said, never mind, ignore that old letter, please burn it, never open it. And so it was burned and never opened. So there's just this weird confession or something letter that he wrote that initially we were all going to get to to read and now it's just gone and it's lost to history and it's such a, a, a strange little thing but all these guys have like strange little things like every single one of them it seems like there's something crazy that that happens in their lives you know that it, yeah yeah uh it was that's really lucky for me for, for this book because there's so many interesting stories except again for millard freaking fillmore <laughs> Although, although that itself was funny, the fact that he was so nothing, so <laughs> confirming of all of our worst fears about him, that was funny, actually. You know you know what surprised me the most? Like, I had recently read Amity Schley's book on Coolidge, and she presents him almost as, like, the best president in history, and you present him completely differently. Like, you kind of say, and this is sort of understandable, but after his nine-year-old son died, you basically say he went crazy. And um, and never really recovered. I didn't know that about him. Yeah, he really sort of, uh, I mean, just lost his spirit after that. He there was just one too many losses for him because he he lost siblings growing up, and his 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 mother died when he was young. And I think having his uh, his son die in such a uh, a weird gangrene related. Accidents, just playing tennis and stubbed his toe, and then eventually killed him. I think that just that just wore Coolidge down, and and just he never really, never really came back from that. Just just sort of heartbroken, spiritless, slept around, not not slept around, spent all his time sleeping in the White House. Would just sleep for for twelve hours and just not doing anything. That's so funny because again, Emily Schlaes doesn't mention mention any of that in her book in her biography of Coolidge. She presents a completely different view, but mm-hmm. it, it was interesting to read that. Yeah, it's uh, I I end up focusing on 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 things like that just because every chapter I was I was always looking for what is the narrative arc, what is the what how can I sell Coolidge right now? And Coolidge became the crazy and depressed guy. But I'd like to to read that book. What's it called? Uh, Coolidge by Amity Schlaes, S-H-L-A-E-S. Check that out. She also wrote, uh, The Forgotten Man, which is kind of about, uh, the beginning of the Depression and the Roosevelt oh. years. It's, it was, it's interesting. She's a good writer. Ooh. Um, so which president would you not, you, you totally would not fight? And I would say from reading your book, it would have to be Lincoln. I wouldn't fight Lincoln. I, my number one not fighting president would be Andrew Jackson. I'm so... Because, because he's insane. He's insane, and he's an act, he's murdered a whole lot of people on on purpose with his hands and with his weapons, and he's just got that kind of. You can you can be stronger than someone in a fight. You be a better fighter, or you can you can want it more. And I don't think I will ever want victory more than Andrew Jackson does. I think he will always have that. I I will will choose death if Jackson gives me that option. And so and so my guess is. Um, James Madison would be your favorite to fight. And then I'm going to guess, again, uh, John Adams' second favorite or no? Uh, I like John Adams so much, so I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to beat him up. But, yeah, he, I could certainly take him in a fight. Uh, I would probably mostly want to fight Richard Nixon just for because he's a monster, just for personal reasons, that it, I would get the most enjoyment out of punching his stupid, sweaty dome. Now, you, you, um, you kind of stop with... The, the dead presidents, like you stop at Gerald Ford or I forget if I forget you stop with Ronald Reagan. No, no, no. You stop with Ronald Reagan. You don't talk about uh, the, the Bushes, Clinton and Obama. So no. uh, would you consider them uh, badasses that you would avoid? Uh, I didn't cover them just because I didn't want a bunch of uh, my search history full of me researching weaknesses of current living uh, former presidents. Because I didn't want the Secret Service after me, um, I would say uh, Jimmy Carter. As soon as he dies, I'm going to write his chapter, and I bet he would be an easy fight. Oh yeah, even though you know he was like a naval commander or whatever. Nah. All right, all right, and then um, I'm trying to think who else. Probably, 
probably I wouldn't want to fight Barack. I I would not. No, I I think he could be he could beat the crap out of me. That guy's an athlete. Yeah, yeah. Um. So so what what uh, comedy books, humor books, uh, comedians? Who's who are your influences? Who do you like the best? Uh, I love Bob Newhart so much. I'm I I'm trying to go through my my brain and say not like there's the obvious ones like. Louis C.K. is everyone's favorite comedian right now for all the right reasons. But I, Bob Newhart has uh, pro- probably won't be able to see it in most of my writing, but he's had a huge inf- inf- influence on me comedically just because he's just so smart and he's so funny and he's done did, did so much with that, with one end of, of uh, a telephone. And, I, I, and I'm just nuts about him. So just to be clear, probably most people know Bob Newhart from... Um, the Bob Newhart show, but before that, he had like the best-selling comedy album, pretty much of all time, where it's just him t- one half talking on a telephone, and most yeah. people probably don't know that, but it really was genius. He had, uh, I think you and uh, Jim Norton were just talking about this too, that he had some kind of very special record that it was the the number one and num- number two best comedy albums of all time, like right right in a row or something yeah. where he back to back honors that. Uh, hadn't done before, hadn't been done before, and he had that honor until maybe Guns N' Roses uh, took also got, got the same whatever this accomplishment is to number one and number two or back to back best selling things. Who, who yeah. would have thought Guns N' Roses yeah. and Bob Newhart had something yeah. in common? <laughs> they occupy this very special club. So, so what 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 other influences? What influences now? There must be some writers now. There's some writers now. Uh, David Wong, who's a, a co-worker here. Jay Pinkerton, who used to work at Cracked and now works writes uh, video games and has actually written some of my favorite articles of all time uh, and can uh, just knows, just practically invented being funny on the internet. Um, J- that's oh. J- Jade or Jim Pinkerton? Jay Pinkerton. Okay, Jay Pinkerton. Yeah, um, Christopher Moore. I am constantly su- surprised and at, at how funny he is. Everything that he comes out with. He's he wrote Lamb, which is one of my favorite books of all time. I encourage everyone to read it and reread it. It's it's uh, it's it was great for me because it's really hard to find good comedy books. Like if you go to uh, a bookstore, the humor section is usually puzzles, um, essays from comedians. Or uh, really bad, like hear, hear a bunch of here's a, a toilet book about jokes, like yeah. like dad jokes kind of thing, um, and it's really hard. To, like there's no separate place for novels that are legitimately very funny. You can go wander around a bookstore and and see that someone has written funny on the back of of book, but you know you never know how you can't really trust those things. So it's hard to just find what is like. I can I can point to very funny sitcoms and very funny comedy movies, but it's it, it's there's no section for that in the bookstore for books like just a, a legitimately hilarious novel. And Christopher Moore is writing all of them. He wrote Lamb and he wrote uh, Serpent of Venice is the one that he wrote that just came out this past year, and it's just so funny and so smart and and a good story too. You know, he's not sacrificing good writing just just to fill everything up with jokes. Well, and and I always I always try to watch good um, uh, comedy before, let's say, giving a talk or whatever. So, like, what 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 would you suggest people watch? Like, what what movies, sitcoms, and stand-up comedians would you watch uh, just to kind of get, you know, get yourself laughing? Sure, I watch uh, John Mulaney's special this year. New in town was uh, one of my favorite stand-up specials in a long time. Uh, this was a great year for specials. Actually, we had New in town. Uh, Bo Burnham was. What came out? Uh, oh, maybe, Bo uh, Burnham's uh, Bo Burnham's what is yeah. the most genius uh, one hour or however long it was one hour of comedy I've ever seen by far. Yeah, that completely floored me, and it drives me insane that that he's I don't know twenty two, twenty three years old. I he's know just, it's like the one so time good. I get jealous watching somebody do comedy. Yeah, and it's it's amazing that it, it's so. It's so him. It's so complete. It's he's not up there trying to be anyone else. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, I I, I watch and read enough comedy that you can sort of you can can 
see where people get their ideas from come are coming from a little bit. You can you can sort of see punchlines coming sometimes, or you see, oh, I could you you want to be the next Louis C.K. That's why you're doing this. And then Bo Burnham, I look at that hour, and I I have no idea where it comes from. I I don't know how how something like that happens. It's so exciting. Him and uh, Tim Minchin. Tim Minchin's probably my favorite. Oh, I don't know him. How do you spell the last name? M I N C H I N. He uh, is going to be a, a, a huge name. He wrote the musical uh, Matilda on Broadway right now and got a lot of acclaim for that and is writing the music for some upcoming Pixar movie, but he's been doing stand-up and, and songs for years and years and years. I think he's from Australia but lived in England or maybe the, the reverse of that. But he's, he's another one like Bo Burnham that is just very specific and has a singular vision and and knows what he is and what he's doing and, and and how he wants to present it to everyone and just every hour he comes out with is another fully formed amazing thing that surprises me. You know you know who also he's not at the same level he's it's a different type of comedy than Bo Burnham but it's still absurdist which is like I don't know if you ever saw Andy Samberg's Harvard commencement speech. I did not. Uh the entire hour makes no sense. And this is this is to Harvard, so that's yeah. part of the joke, it, is that he makes like zero sense during the entire thing, and he's talking to like all of the Harvard graduates, and it's just hilarious. But it's also absurdist in a Bo Burnham kind of style, yeah. I think. That's cool. I have to check that out. Yeah, although he's not being himself. You're right. Bo Burnham is totally being himself, whereas Andy Samberg's playing a role of an absurdist comedian. So, yeah. And there's a difference. But like, what what in the in the Louis C.K. genre? Who do you like? Uh, I like Louis. Obviously, I like Hannibal Burris a whole lot. He gets maybe gets a little bit weird. Um, do you see Wyatt Snacks new special? No. Uh, what's I don't know that one. Oh, it's on Netflix right now. It's called I think it's just called Live in Brooklyn, and it's really really funny and really interesting. And he shot this this special in some club, and then afterwards, uh, is it like just for the special itself is acting out a whole lot of the his jokes with puppets like you'll see him on stage talking and then it'll pull out to uh now he's like the stage is projected on a screen and in front are is like a Wyatt Snack puppet and a couple other puppets and it sounds really goofy and really weird but it's just it's just fun it's a funny little thing that he did where, where he's going to punctuate this joke with this visual sketch thing sort of Huh, I'll definitely check that out. And what um, what uh, sitcoms and and movies? I I need tons of good suggestions because I'm I'm kind of, I'm voracious for this stuff. Sure, uh, I like Brooklyn Nine Nine. Brooklyn Nine Nine. Um, All right, so an M- an Andy Samberg fan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually I actually wasn't a fan of his on SNL. Um, I like all I, the Lonely I, Island stuff. Yeah, he he just always seemed on on, on Saturday Night Live like. Like he was winking too much. Like he, like, hey, I'm Andy Samberg and I'm playing this character right now. I'm, I don't know, like something about not fully committing to sketch characters and and acknowledging that it's it's him playing a part and being silly. Um, so I needed to be won over by him. And then Brooklyn Nine Nine did it. I just think he's it's the opposite of SNL, where he really is committed to this to this character. And it's it's an interesting character because he's he's. Goofy, but also great at, at at his job and very very present and driven. And I like it. Right. Um, what about uh, the best movie of all time, Superbad? I like Superbad a whole lot. Best movie of all time is uh, interesting, uh, but I I really enjoy that movie. I used to watch it like once a year, just as there's there's things like. Uh, super bad and Arrested Development that yes Arrested uh, Development I was going to mention next yeah. I get into my head is like you need to watch this w- once a year in its entirety to see jokes that you missed the first 11 times around or just you know 30 Rock and, and Arrested Development for me are, are comedy writing school and Simpsons as well of just like rewatching them and trying to learn more lessons learn whatever I can Simpsons and I like uh, Family Guy in that genre I don't watch Family Guy. I I I watched it for a while and then it sort of fell off the the map for me. I like American Dad. I like, I think that's very good. Oh yeah, same same uh, creator, uh, 
I guess uh, David Zuckerman and uh, Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love Futurama. I love all of anything that Edgar Wright touches. I will, I will, will watch Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and World's End whenever they're on. Anytime I, I catch a glimpse of one of them popping up on HBO, sure, I'll watch it. I'll sit here. I'll cancel my plans and watch this. Oh, I've never watched any of those. Right, really? Gives, yeah, this gives me a lot of good stuff. Oh, man. I'm so jealous of you. You get to experience those movies for the first time. That's great. That's very exciting. Yeah, no, Super Bad, I've probably watched like 30 times, and Arrested Development all the way through probably about 10 times. Have you ever seen the um, BBC series Peep Show? Yes. Oh, my God. I love Peep Show. That is an excellent one. Yeah, I that, love And their, their other show, that, uh, that Mitchell and Webb look, their sketch show is great, and I don't... Uh, this is a bad thing to say for someone who works in comedy, but I don't really like sketch shows very much. I think. What about that, Mr. Show, David Cross and Bob Odenkirk? I do like Mr. Show. I like Mr. Show. I like Key and Peele, uh, and, I, and I love Mitchell and Webb look. Uh, and Kids in the Hall, for me, was, was important growing up. That was a, an exciting thing for young Daniel to find. So, so what's next for young Daniel? Are you going to write another book? I yeah I'm working right now on uh, we're turning how to fight presidents into a children's book now it's not <laughs> going to be fighting we don't exactly know what that means right now but the one of the other people at Random House one of the other editors there saw how to fight presidents and was like hey I'm in charge of the the children's division now and I think this would be a great children's book do you want to do that can you write this without cursing or movies, movie references that children wouldn't understand, uh, and can you do less fighting? I'm like, sure, okay. I'm actually really, really excited about that, because uh, it's certainly the book that I would have loved as a kid, because I, I, I liked being mischievous, mis mischievous, not in a, I'm going to pull pranks on the teacher sort of way, but I did like, I, w I was a, a little punk kid who liked when a teacher was was wrong about something, you can you can you can correct. So it's just just using uh, knowledge for evil purposes, I guess. That would be fun. Have, have you seen um, uh, B. J. Novak's children's book that just came out? This book has no pictures. No, I did not. Is it good? Yeah, he basically it's it's insane. So he, he, like father, you know, if you're a father or mother reading the book to your three or four year old, you have to read the page. And the page is always is always like super silly, and it's really true. There's no books, there's no pictures in the book, and kids love the book. Oh, great! That's yeah, it awesome. might be an interesting thing to look at just to get some some ideas from that. Yeah, definitely. What about uh, what about making it into a movie like a guy who time travels around and has to fight all these presidents? Like that that's a scavenger hunt. That would be great. <laughs> Gee, let's. Uh... Let's get this, this, this screenplay going, you and I. Let's <laughs> All right, I'm going to work on it. Um, but no, what about any other uh, books not related to this book? Uh, I'm toying around with, it, with, with a couple of things. I have been reading a whole lot about the very, very early America, 1776 Revolutionary War America, because um, I want to do something with that, but I'm not sure what yet. I don't know if I would do another comedic nonfiction book where I'm talking about early America or just a, a novel based in and around that time because the the it's a really cool time in America. It's it's very, very wild and the uh, amount of people that are that we all know so much about you know, Washington and Adams and, and everyone else from that time that now we know so much about. That just to me is a very interesting cast of characters to play with. It's also crazy how it could have gone either way so many times. Yeah. Like and it's there's so much of it is really really funny to me. Our early uh war stuff is funny to me because they we were we were so untrained and we were such babies and everyone I mean the revolutionary war starts because it's a bunch of people who don't want to be told what to do. And of course that that follows through to the army like the, you you recruited a bunch of people who already didn't want to listen to orders and then you're trying to get them to shape up and be a good army and these people would just the soldiers would just leave they would just desert and they were like well now i well he told me what to do so i got bored and i left and they were even when they were low on ammo would just 
get bored and shoot their guns, and they were they were starting fires by firing their muskets at in into whatever their fire pits were, and just these untrained, undisciplined a holes, and and poor Washington at the head of it, just trying to get some order and get some people to follow him because this is the most important thing America will ever do. I don't know. It's really it's it's funny to me, and it's and it's again not well covered in history textbooks. You know, I, I don't remember learning about how shitty our army was in the books because it was the a narrative that they sell you in school is how noble and important this was and how we are the underdogs and we we took down our oppressors. Um, and that's fine as a story to tell kids, to get them to memorize dates for their history test, but I like this, the actual version, a, a lot better. It's just more well, interesting and, and true. And Washington would, like, shoot people, right, who, who, yeah. who tried to leave. Yeah, yeah. He... Uh, he was a badass. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would fight him. Like, suppose, like, like the stories you read about him, like people, he was like physically imposing to all yeah. the people around him. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would not want to want to fight him. I don't want to get on on his bad side at all. Well, Dan, thanks so much. Uh, I'm gonna read the title out loud again of your book as soon as I bring it up here. Um, completely ignoring the fact that I just read it. Uh, so how to fight presidents defending yourself against the badasses who ran this country. I re I really, again, like the fact that like I've been reading, I I'm obsessed with presidential history too, but I honestly have to say, I learned a lot reading this book and it was laugh out loud funny. Like my, my wife was reading uh, a book about the anatomy and I kept laughing and she was like, what are you reading? And I had to show her, I was reading this how to fight presidents book. So <laughs> That's it was awesome. hilarious. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on. We talked about cracked humor, all your influences, and then of course we talked about presidents and which one you would fight. Uh, I guess what what could be a, a fun final question? Like, um, so so T R you wouldn't fight, Lincoln you wouldn't fight, Jackson's the most insane. What's what's it, now? You call Franklin Roosevelt a badass, but admittedly the guy couldn't walk. So yeah. this is not to say anything against people who can't walk one way or the other. Uh, my mom actually had polio around the same time that Roosevelt had polio, but uh, uh, you could kick his ass probably. I uh, certainly have that advantage over him, yes. So, but Eisenhower, uh, you, you didn't really get into it as much with Eisenhower, but he was, he was a badass too. You couldn't, I wouldn't want to fight him. Yeah, I wouldn't want to fight him. I go back and forth on... Kennedy, because I know he was he was an athletic cat, and uh, uh, another guy who was very very driven and insane, um, but also was riddled with a whole lot of injuries. Just had a really bad back, and also used a wheelchair occasionally and and crutches. We just didn't get a lot of pictures of it because he asked us not to, and the the press respected presidents at that time. Um, I don't, I don't know. know. As as tough as he is, I think he he he's I'm. I think the fact that my back isn't weak gives me gives me the advantage there. You know, I don't know if you know this story about Eisenhower, but when he was a kid also, he was sickly. Like, there was one point, he had a gangrene issue, and they wanted to amputate one of his legs, and he kind of locked everybody out of his room and refused to... They told him, if we don't amputate your leg, you're going to die. And he refused to let anybody amputate his leg, and he survived. Really? That's it, so cool. Yeah. I so, that. All right, so I'm, I'm filling you. I'm filling the expert in on a little bit more <laughs> badassery on Eisenhower. <laughs> so I, I like it. how you say too. Just his name alone makes you want to stay away. <laughs> so, but uh, Dan, thanks a lot for joining me on the podcast, and uh, I look forward to everything else you do. And I and I also really enjoy your articles on Cracked. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. For more from James, check out The James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today.
AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.